Coming up on today's episode of Locked On Sooners, we've got Parker Thune of 247 Sports, OU Insider, also from 94.7, the ref out of Norman, to give us a little recruiting update on the 2023-2024 classes with visits coming up this March. So stay tuned. We'll have that and more on today's episode of Locked On Sooners. Are Locked On Sooners, your daily podcast on the Oklahoma Sooners, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Sooners Nation, and welcome to the Locked On Sooners podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online is where the game starts. And joining me now is Parker Thune from 247 Sports. Parker, how's it going, man? He's also from 947, the ref in Norman on the Steely and Thune at Noon Show, a place that I've had the pleasure of popping on, uh, at least through the football season. So, Parker, man, how's, how are things? How have things been since uh, football season ended? What's going on with you, man? Man, it's been fantastic, John. Always a pleasure to jump on here with you and talk a little bit of Sooners football and recruiting. But yeah, the last couple months have kind of been a whirlwind. It's crazy to think that uh, as of tomorrow, Monday, it'll be three months to the day since Lincoln Riley announced to the world that he was leaving for USC. And uh, on the one hand, it feels like it's been years since that day. And on the other hand, it feels like it was just yesterday. So kind of a paradox in that regard. But uh, no, it's been fun uh, just getting to kind of get a sense of what Brent Venables and his new staff at Oklahoma are looking for on the recruiting trail, the vision that they're trying to build and to execute uh, in Norman as they try to get the Sooners back to the pedestal in college football and break that 22 year drought without a national title. So, uh, yeah, great, great time to be covering the Oklahoma Sooners. And you would hope that once the season rolls around, you would certainly expect it'll be a good time to be a fan of the Oklahoma Sooners as well. Yeah, it's been a very interesting uh, few months for sure. And and for us, I know we're looking at it and and like our guys over at Sooners Wire, uh, are, are, we're kind of seeing the trends a little bit. You know, this is a different kind of style on both sides of the football, what they're really prioritizing. You know, on defense in particular, from what we're gathering, they're really hitting heavy along the defensive line. Is that kind of the sense that you all are getting over at OE Insider? Yeah, so, and that's one of those things that Oklahoma will be able to do now with this new staff that they previously couldn't do is because uh, you have three guys in particular, Brent Venables, Todd Bates, and Jay Valai that have deep, deep recruiting tr- ties in the Southeast. And what do we know about the Southeast? Generally, it produces a lot of talent. If you think about where the Mississippi River falls on the United States map, John, there have been three teams since 2000 that lie west of the Mississippi River that have won a national title, Oklahoma, Texas, USC. That's it. Wow. So, When you consider that and you take a look year to year at how many of those high four star and five star guys come out of the states of Florida, Georgia, Alabama, that is a region of the country where it does Oklahoma a lot of good to have a guy like Todd Bates and a guy like Brent Venables and a guy like Jay Valai, three guys uh, that have recruited that area in the past, have those relationships, have the respect of prospects from within that geographical region. And so One of the position groups where uh, I don't know if it's coincidence or if it's systemic, what the case may be, uh, I would have to dig a little bit more into the data to find that out. But one of the position groups that has been really, really heavy on talent in that southeast region in the last few years and for the next couple of cycles ahead is defensive line. And uh, you are looking at a staff as well, and particularly a guy in Brent Venables that has ties to IMG Academy, which is the nation's premier developmental prep institution for football players. The state of Oklahoma just saw one of their, uh, or perhaps their very first player uh, in David Stone enroll at IMG. He was previously at Dell City High School, uh, just south of OKC. Uh, David Stone is a guy that Oklahoma is very, very well positioned with in the class of 2024. He's going to be a high four star, if not a five star on the defensive line. And that's one of those guys that you look at as somebody that you can build a class around because it's no particular secret that he favors Oklahoma. You follow him on social media. You get the sense that uh, he is all in with the Sooners. I have a crystal ball prediction in for him to Oklahoma, as do uh, several of my counterparts over at 24-7 Sports. So Stone is a guy that, you know, 
though he's from Oklahoma, he's playing ball in the Southeast right now, and that could be Oklahoma's in to IMG and to the Southeast uh, in terms of that talent along the defensive line. A couple other guys they're in really good standing with. There's another 2024 defensive lineman, T.A. Cunningham, that will absolutely be a five-star. Everybody is obviously following the circus that is the LT Overton recruitment, and Mm -hmm. as the dead period ends in the month of February and we get on in the month of March, uh, he's going to take his five official visits and I like where Oklahoma's position for LT Overton. I don't know that I would consider them the favorite for him at the moment, uh, but I do like where they stand. So between David Stone, T.A. Cunningham, Lebius Overton, and then you throw in a guy like Derek LeBlanc as well out of Osceola, Florida, that Oklahoma's in a really good spot with. Defensive line is one of those positions in the coming years where Oklahoma's going to start to recruit really well, and more specifically, they're going to start to recruit really well in the Southeast. And you mentioned Levy Overton. I was going to ask you about him actually a little bit later, but uh, what is a guy like maybe even Makaya Overton, who's, you know, entered the transfer portal from Liberty, you know, obviously they're looking at being a package deal. He's a guy that he, he was not a big guy when he got to Liberty, but he bulked up and became an interior defensive line player. If you bring both of those guys into Oklahoma, what does it kind of do for their interior defensive line? Yeah, well, it's big time. And look, to be honest with you, I don't know how much Makaya Overton plays at a school like Oklahoma. Uh, You look at his career statistics. He's been at Liberty three seasons. He has all of one career tackle, John. So that's that's not a guy that you're bringing in with the expectation that he's going to be an impact player. But when he's a factor in the recruitment of his younger brother, who is a consensus five star prospect, that's a guy you have to make room for by hook or by crook. And The fortunate thing for Oklahoma is that they're in a position where it's going to be a lot easier for them to make room scholarship wise for a guy like Micaiah Overton than Texas A&M and Ohio State and Georgia, these other schools that they're going up against uh, in W.S. Overton's recruitment. So, you know, we've seen Oklahoma be in a situation like this before, uh, less than a year ago, in fact, when. Uh, the state's top wide receiver, Talon Shetron, out of Edmond Santa Fe, was committed to Oklahoma, had been for several months. Oklahoma State offered his twin brother, who was a more lightly regarded prospect. Oklahoma said, no, you know what? Uh, we don't get the sense that the brother is going to be good enough to play for us. So we'll honor your scholarship, Talon, but we're not going to offer your brother. Well, then he ends up flipping to Oklahoma State and they become a package deal up in Stillwater. Now, The philosophy recruiting wise also changes when you have turnover in the staff naturally. And perhaps somebody like Brent Venables would have been more eager to throw an offer at Tabri Shetron if it meant they got his brother. But one way or another, Oklahoma, from what I'm told, is going to do whatever it takes to get Lebius Overton on campus. If that means making an offer to his brother, Micaiah, well, they've already they already went and made that offer. They were the first school on that bus, on that bandwagon. They made the offer to Micaiah Overton right away and made it clear that he was welcome at the University of Oklahoma if that's where those two wanted to end up. If that means playing the NIL game, I'm told Mm -hmm. Oklahoma is prepared to play the NIL game. And uh, obviously that is a strategy that Texas A&M leveraged to great success in the class of 2022. And it's a strategy that a school like Georgia and a school like Ohio State, those schools are well-equipped Uh, to be able to utilize as well. But again, I'll go back to it. Oklahoma is going to do whatever it takes because the father, Milton, played at Oklahoma. These two guys are Oklahoma legacies, and you don't come across a player like LT Overton who has ties that deep to the University of Oklahoma and is as talented as LT Overton is. You don't get a guy like that in every single class. And the Sooners had two of them. In this past class, in this 2022 class, in Gabriel Brownlow Dindy and in LT Overton. Unfortunately, you saw Gabriel Brownlow Dindy flip to Texas A&M after Calvin Thibodeau wasn't retained at Oklahoma. And similarly, you're now seeing Texas A&M make a big push for Lebius Overton because shoot, that, I guess they regard just about any blue chip talents, especially on the defensive line, as gravy at this mm-hmm. point. You know, the more, the merrier. And right. there are reasons for that. Uh, I, I'm resisting the urge to unpack them because it would take a lot of time. But regardless, Texas A&M and Oklahoma is what it looks like it's going to be for Lebius Overton. Those are the two schools uh, that are going to have the 
inside track to secure his commitment. And it all ultimately comes down to uh, the visits in the month of March and how Oklahoma stacks up in the Overton's eyes against Texas A&M and Georgia and Ohio State and Oregon. Now, I am told Oklahoma's positioning themselves for the final visit with LT Overton. And with any recruit, the final visit carries some weight. And so you'd hope that that works in Oklahoma's favor, but everything's wide open right now. No school, I would say, has a distinct advantage in this recruitment. I do expect it'll be Oklahoma or Texas A&M. I think those are the two schools that, like I said, have the inside track. But I'm not comfortable elevating one over the other right now. Yeah, it's going to be a pretty hard-fought recruiting battle for a guy that um, that talented. And, and for someone who just reclassified, I think people, most teams thought they still had more time with him. And then when he reclassified to 2023, it kind of made the push a little bit more um, urgent for, for a lot of these schools that were in his final five. Uh, but we're going to talk more about recruiting the 2024 class. It's a couple of position groups. I'd like to ask Parker about after I talk to y'all about bet online, football might be over this season, but basketball is in full steam for both pro and college hoops. For all the latest odds, totals, player performance props to where the next fired coach is going to land, BetOnline.net is the number one spot for all your sports betting needs. BetOnline remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. And it's not just basketball. BetOnline.net is your source for hockey, boxing, UFC odds, right to Olympic coverage when the 2024 games come along. So you can stick around to BetOnline and, and get on some of that action. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. Bet online is where the game starts. All right, we talked about the defensive line. There's so much more to unpack there because, I mean, a guy like Miguel Chavis, he's made a ton of noise in this recruiting cycle. One uh, was one of 247 Sports um, top recruiters. I can't remember who wrote the article, just kind of handed out those recruiting awards, but um, somebody who was very uh, highly thought of uh, coming in as his first position coach job. Um, so it's really neat to see just those guys all kind of fuse together and get the job done really really well but let's let's flip to the wide receiver position because as jeff levy's come in and we got a new offense or not really a new offensive staff but a new offensive coordinator like defensive line's been a focus it seems like there's been a focus on and on attracting or going after taller bigger wide receivers is that something you all have noticed as well Yes, I mean it's it's conspicuous when you look at the the genotype that Jeff Lebby and Kale Gundy appear to be recruiting in the new era of Oklahoma football. The common denominator is size. And I think when you look at Oklahoma and what they have currently in the wide receiver room, that's one thing that they conspicuously lack. Now you added a couple of real sizable true freshmen in this past signing class and Nick Anderson and Jaden Gibson. But outside of those guys, nobody in that wide receiver room is north of six foot two. And in fact, most of those most of those guys are on the south side of six feet. And so I think it, more than anything else, it's it signals to the rest of the world, and particularly to Sooner Nation, that, hey, we see that we have no pun intended, a bit of a shortcoming in this particular area. Uh -huh. And we're going to address that now. I don't know if three, four years down the line, Oklahoma is recruiting strictly six four six five type wide receivers but what i do know is that for the next couple of classes here just based on what they already have at their disposal in that wide receiver room they're going to do their best to recruit some size and you look at ashton cozart in the class of 2023 the guy that they have committed at the moment six foot three 190 pounds they're pursuing kyler casper a kid out of the state of arizona whose dad played ball at iowa and was later a wide receiver in the NFL for several years. He's six foot five, pushing six six. Those are the types of guys that Oklahoma's recruiting. And the reason that they're recruiting them is because they don't have any of them right now. Yeah. They don't have those guys. Because when you can line up, say, Kyler Casper, Ashton Cozart, and a guy like Jaden Gibson on second and goal from the eight yard line, what you have. When you line up wide receivers that have size, you know, everybody thinks about big wide receivers and what do they think about, right? They think about the fade. They mm -hmm. think about the 50-50 ball. And there's truth to that, right? Th that is a distinct advantage that a larger in stature wide receiver will have is he'll be more apt to go up and get the 50-50 ball or the end zone goal line fade type of throw. But what you can also do with a wide receiver that has more size and has longer reach is it gives you 
more of a capability to throw the ball where only he can get it. Right. And that doesn't always take the form of a 50-50 ball or a goal line fake. Uh, and di- one of Dylan Gabriel's very conspicuous strengths as a quarterback is his ability to place the ball where only his wide receivers can get it. Uh, we have a new contributor over at OUinsider.com. His name's J.D. Piquel. If you hit him up on Twitter, he's got daily film breakdowns. And one of the things that he's continually uh, hit on with Dylan Gabriel is that he's really good at that. He's really good at placing the ball for his wide receivers. And when you have a wide receiver with six foot five frame and a six foot nine wingspan, as opposed to a six foot frame and a six foot two wingspan, that doesn't necessarily, that's not to say that Dylan Gabriel can't make X throw to the smaller guy uh, that he could to the larger guy. But what it is to say is that it gives him a bit more leeway on that, on those types of throws when your guy has an extra six or seven inches of wingspan or an extra three or four inches of height. So particularly for Dylan Gabriel and what he brings to the quarterback position, that's also one area in which it helps you to have some bigger wide receivers is when you have a quarterback that plays the game the way that Dylan Gabriel does. Having wide receivers with some size is definitely going to help him out a little bit more than it would otherwise. And let's stick on the offensive side of the ball with the running back position because, I mean, they're, they're still hot after a lot of the top names in the 2023 class, or Richard Young, uh, Cedric Baxter, several guys that are right at the top of those rankings. Who's the guy you think is the most likely player that Oklahoma could land out of that 2023 class at running back? Well, it depends on how you classify Dylan Edwards, because most people look at his 24-7 sports profile and they say, oh, he's a running back. You know, all those crystal ball predictions in for Oklahoma. Uh, He must be going there and he's going to be their next big time running back. Well, look, that's true. Oklahoma is the leader in the clubhouse for Dylan Edwards. He'll be back on campus this coming weekend. And to be quite honest with you, John, I think a week from now, Dylan Edwards could officially be a Sooner. I think that's a very realistic possibility on the table. But Dylan Edwards is not being recruited as a pure running back Mm -hmm. by Oklahoma. He's being recruited in that type of slash weapon role, reminiscent of Tavon Austin at West Virginia, for instance. Dylan Edwards is five foot nine, so smaller in stature. But man, you turn on his tape, it looks like he's got a rocket strapped to his back every single time he kicks it into fifth gear. I mean, man, he is the fastest guy on any football field he steps on. And so it's that type of guy that is going to open up a whole new world of possibilities in Jeff Levy's offense because there's so many places you can line him up and because he's a mismatch as soon as the football is in his hands. So though he is officially classified as a running back, and though I will, ex- I do expect that he will be a sooner, I don't think Dylan Edwards falls into that category that you're asking about. So Mm -hmm. my answer to you is actually Trey Wisner, the four-star running back out of Waco Connolly. Uh, That is a guy that has a lot of love for Oklahoma. His family has a lot of love for Oklahoma. He's visited, I want to say, three times at this point, uh, and he'll be back again. Uh, I would expect that Oklahoma will get an official from him, and I don't have a crystal ball in yet, uh, but at this point I would expect that – Unless catastrophe befalls DeMarco Murray and the Oklahoma staff, unless mm-hmm. something goes horribly wrong, they're going to secure Trey Wisner's commitment. And DeMarco Murray has done a tremendous job as a recruiter over the past couple of cycles. And I think that will be reflected and thus far is reflected in the relationship he's built with Trey Wisner and his family. Yeah, DeMarco Murray is just crushing it like constantly. And, and that kind of brings up somebody I, I do want to ask about, and that's DeAndre Moore. Uh, he was the, the wide receiver running back commit uh, out of Las Vegas, transferred to Los Alamitos, was committed to the Sooners, announced that he was staying committed to the Sooners back when the coaching change happened. But then uh, it was right around National Signing Day, if I remember right, he decommitted. What happened on that front? <laughs> well, I mean, it's one of those things, John, where – Oklahoma just decided to go their separate ways with DeAndre Moore. And DeMarco Murray did a fantastic job in maintaining that relationship with Moore throughout the coaching change and uh, made it abundantly clear to DeAndre Moore that he was still welcome at Oklahoma, that they still wanted him at Oklahoma, and that Oklahoma wasn't going to be in shambles regardless of who the next head coach was. And that said, when Jeff Levy and that new offensive staff – 
got in place from what I understand. Uh, they just came to the realization that uh, there were maybe some other guys at the wide receiver position in the 2023 cycle that they thought more highly of and that were a better fit for their offense in the long term than DeAndre Moore. Uh, and so they essentially hit the pause button on recruiting him. And if you look at DeAndre Moore's physical makeup, you know, five foot 11, we come back to the height conversation, yeah. right? And Ashton Cozart's committed six foot three. Oklahoma's in a really good spot for Jalen Hale, six foot three as well. We already talked about Kyler Casper, six foot five. So DeAndre Moore is not a bad football player. And it's not as if the Oklahoma staff and the new uh, offensive staff considered him a bad football player. It just comes down to there's a certain type of wide receiver that they're trying to recruit. And DeAndre Moore, while he might have fit the bill for the former staff at Oklahoma, didn't really fit the bill for the new staff at Oklahoma. And so, uh, yeah, it, it, it came to be one of those situations where it it, it was going to kind of behoove both parties to go their separate ways. DeAndre Moore had a lot of other schools pushing for his services, and he'll continue to have a lot of schools pushing for his services. And Oklahoma is going to be in position to land at least three or four blue chip wideouts. And so... I don't think they are any worse off just because of some of those other high-end targets that they're very much in the mix for. And I don't think DeAndre Moore is any worse off, uh, even though I am I know his old high school buddy, Javante Barnes, would have been thrilled to play alongside him in Norman. Yeah. So it's not like uh, Jeff Levy is going to be coming and ask me to come play wide receiver anytime soon. One, I'm not talented enough, but two, I definitely, I mean, he just cuts me out because I'm not tall enough. So, I mean, that's already one strike against me. But hey, we're going to continue talking. We've got some offensive line questions for Parker. And then just want to talk about what kind of just the general sense that he's getting from this staff as you know, we go into more visits in the month of March and Parker's going to be hitting the road, checking out some prospects on the seven on seven. But let me talk to you about Built Bar. Built Bar is the best tasting protein bar ever. It's easy to eat, 100% covered in chocolate, and it tastes great. They've got so many great flavors. They've even got something called Built Puffs, which is a marshmallow-based you know, protein bar. Yeah, you heard that. It's marshmallowy. Like it tastes great. It's a treat. Like these protein bars, they're really good for you. 130 to 170 calories, four or five grams of sugar, four or five grams of net carbs. And again, so many great flavors, mint brownie, coconut, coconut almond, peanut butter brownie. And they're always coming out with new flavors as well. Anytime that they got the coconut brownie chunk going, that is the first on in my cart to make sure I get a, a box of that. So go to built.com, use promo code LOCKED15, get 15% off your next order at built.com using promo code LOCKED15. All right, Parker, one more prospect I want to talk to you about that seems to really have a lot of momentum going to Oklahoma is offensive lineman Caden Green out of Missouri. You just, you're hearing a lot of things connecting the two. If you follow either him or OU on social media, just I feel like his name pops up on my feed every couple of days. Yeah, Caden Green, man, that's a fun one for me uh, because I've gotten to know Caden and his family really, really well over the course of his recruitment. Okay, uh, I didn't he know is that. a re oh yeah, he is originally from the Tulsa area. His parents are alumni of Oral Roberts, so uh, I want to say he lived in the state of Oklahoma until he was ten or eleven. He would have gone to Tulsa Union uh, had he not ended up moving, uh, had, and had he and his family not ended up uh, moving up to the Kansas City area. Uh, but he grew up a Sooner fan. He grew up rooting for OU, and so. Uh, that was really cool for me to find out that I think first I talked to him, which was almost a year ago at this point. That was one of the first questions I asked him is, uh, so, hey, who'd you grow up rooting for? Because, you know, kids that grow up in the Kansas City area it could be Kansas State. It could be Missouri, could be KU. But I was really surprised to hear uh, him outline his background and uh, how he was a Sooner fan as a child and had moved from the Tulsa area. And it was at that point that I figured, okay, Oklahoma's going to have more than a puncher's chance here. And so I actually uh, I had a few more conversations with him, ended up putting in an OU crystal ball for him last May, I believe. And ever since then, Bill Biedenboe has done a tremendous job recruiting Caden Green. They love Brent Venables. I mean, love him to death. Brent Venables has been instrumental in that recruitment uh, ever since he took over as Oklahoma's new head coach. Caden Green is the type of guy as well that other players gravitate towards. And he's going to be the type of guy that if he wants to, you know, if he feels comfortable in his decision and he gives the Oklahoma staff his commitment by April or May, 
He's the type of guy that's going to be able to go and recruit his peers and recruit them pretty effectively. So I think that's something that the Oklahoma staff will be looking to accomplish with Caden Green is, hey, jump in the boat with us early and then bring all your buddies. And there are several in the Kansas City area that Oklahoma is either pursuing or will pursue in this 2023 cycle and beyond. By the way, Caden Green's teammate, 2025 wide receiver Isaiah Mosey, Oklahoma legacy. His dad was on the 2000 national championship team as a running back, and he is likely to be a five star in that class. So that's another guy where if OU locks down Caden Green, maybe they have the inside track uh, to get Isaiah Mosey's commitment as well. But here's what I do know. Caden Green isn't going to publicly announce his commitment until November at the very earliest. And so, yeah, his birthday is November 15th. Obviously, early signing day is in mid-December. So from what I understand, he'll either announce on his birthday or he'll just wait till early signing day. But as we know, John, a whole lot of guys that announce their commitment on a specific date have oftentimes been committed long in advance. So if Oklahoma can get Caden Green to give them a silent commitment earlier in this cycle and then start recruiting his peers around them, Man, I, I tell you what, that is a guy that can be the linchpin of this class for OU. And they have their quarterback in Jackson Arnold. They have a couple of guys in Ashton Cozart and Josh Bates that have been really, really vociferous on social media trying to recruit their peers to Norman with them. And Caden Green's just going to be another arrow in the quiver in that regard if Oklahoma can lock him down. So next weekend, he'll be on campus. That's a pivotal visit for Oklahoma, particularly with all the other elite talent that's going to be in town. And I really do believe that they are in more than adequate position to be able to secure Caden Green's commitment. I think it's to me, it's a matter of when, not if. Michigan's in this race. Baylor's in this race. I'm not saying it's a hundred percent a sure thing, but what I am saying is that kid and that family, they love Bill Biedenboe. They love Brent Venables and Oklahoma is in a really, really strong position. Yeah. Cause nothing's a sure thing until they sign. I mean, I feel like exactly. If you Oklahoma found that out the hard way, right. I've, really, I've only really been following recruiting for the last couple of years and it, it just shocks me every time. I'm like what somebody decommitted, like, well, of course they don't have to actually have a decision made until they sign the paper and so it's been fascinating to learn about all that and how it all breaks down and works out but talking more just about the the philosophy what it's the the vibe is like as somebody who is a recruiting analyst um just what's the the general sense you get from the team in and really, and even from families, like how they feel about Oklahoma, how Oklahoma's feeling about the the recruiting trail, working with the media, things like that. Well, the buzzword that I hear from recruits and their families is genuine. That's probably the one term that I've uh, that I've heard most often in conversations that I've have had as it pertains to Oklahoma and the new staff under Brent Venables. Is they're so genuine, and I would imagine part of that is just simply do the stark contrast between Brent Venables and his predecessor Mm -hmm. who told a lot of recruits in the 2022 cycle told and told them very adamantly that he wasn't going anywhere only to jump ship for USC in the dead of night. And so I don't know how much of it has to do with, you know, simply comparing the new guy to the old one, but I will say this Brent Venables has made a very, very strong impression on a lot of these kids because of what a, high character man of integrity he is and he's he's obviously a tremendously successful football coach Mm -hmm. and that's no secret he's coached in eight national championship games he's won three of them he's never been a part of a team that did not conclude the season by playing in a bowl game so the football resume is there but i think what strikes kids and their families more so than anything else about brent venables is how he's just a straightforward stand-up guy who's going to give it to you like it is. And uh, that that can come off as harsh at times. I mean, he said it to the media in his signing day uh, press conference. He said, look, the only thing I ever guarantee these guys when I'm recruiting them is that, hey, you get to Oklahoma, I'm going to be recruiting your replacement immediately. I'm going to be recruiting yeah. somebody to come and beat you out. That's the only thing you're promised. And so – Look, it's tough love at times, but I think that's one of the things that people really respect Brent Venables for is the fact that uh, he's not going to sugarcoat anything. And uh, as far as the offers that Oklahoma is making in the 2023 class and beyond, 
I don't know how much it's been discussed on social media or how much it's been hashed out, but every single one of these offers uh, that's being given out by the Oklahoma staff is a committable offer. So it's not the type of thing where Oklahoma's handing out the offer so that they can circle back around in six months or a year when a kid really blows up and say, hey, we were on you as early as all these other schools. And mm -hmm. it's not the type of thing where they're offering just to say that they offered uh, and maybe keep the kid warm in case one of their priority targets falls through. No, these are all kids that at any point can pick up the phone, call the University of Oklahoma and say, I want to come play football for you. And they will take that commitment. No questions asked. And so I think that is that is one of the key distinctions between the Venables recruiting philosophy and the former recruiting philosophy that was employed at Oklahoma is uh, the offer list is going to be a lot smaller and a lot narrower. But all those guys are legitimate targets for Oklahoma. Those are all guys that Oklahoma wants and will actively recruit. There will be no hierarchy. There will be no tiers. Right? Everybody at a given position that Oklahoma offers is somebody that they legitimately want in the Crimson and Cream. Yeah, and they haven't been shy about going after you know un unranked players or three star players. It's if they if they see somebody that they think is a player and they're they're going to help their football team. Yes, the stars matter, but also there there are things that go beyond that for this coaching staff where they they're looking at a lot of different things and sometimes you know like a guy like I think of a guy like Eric McCarty who's currently unranked on 247 sports there's something to that guy that they love and made an offer to when there was maybe only five other schools that had offers out and and maybe the biggest name one was maybe Pitt um you know, there was something to him that stood out enough to this coaching staff that they said, we've got to get that guy. And to their credit, they got him. Um, so I want to play a quick game with you before we let you go. And this of is just course. to see, okay, uh, just give me your just real quick feeling on David Hicks. Uh, okay, how do you want me to phrase this? Like percentage chance or? Feel good, feel bad. Feel good. It'll be OU or it'll be A&M. One of those two. I kind of like the conversation we were having with LT Overton. I don't know that I would elevate one school over another at this point. If you asked me to put chips on the table, I'd give the edge to Oklahoma right now, quite frankly. But much like LT Overton, that's a battle that's going to come down to the Sooners and the Aggies. Okay. Um, and then as far as the 2021, or sorry, yeah, the 2021 freshman, who's the guy you're most looking forward to seeing play in this new, under this new coaching staff? I think the easy answer is Danny Stutzman, and I love Danny Stutzman uh, as a person, as a football player, but uh, I want to I want to not take the easy way out here, so I'll go with Ethan Downs. Man, I, I am on record predicting that Ethan Downs will be an all-Big 12 player next year, and I really think he has the potential for double-digit double sacks as he presumably moves into a full-time starting role on Oklahoma's front seven. Okay, and then on the offensive side of the ball with the same class, the 2021 class. Ooh, <laughs> I think I, I think I'm gonna have to go with Jalil Farouk okay. just because he came on so strong in the bowl game. Yep. And it was really the first time all year he got to showcase his talents in extended minutes, extended playing time uh, and made some really outstanding plays. He's got a ton of speed. He's got size. He's got ball skills. That is a complete wide receiver. He's so much of an athlete, in fact, that. Brent Venables was recruiting him at Clemson to play defensive back, if okay. that gives you any idea yeah. of uh, just how versatile and how sh how much sheer athleticism he brings to the table. So I think Jalil Far Farouk is a guy that I'm really, really excited to see on the offensive side of the football for Oklahoma next year. Yeah, that's that's one of the guys I've been really excited to talk about as well over the last couple months. Just I feel like he's going to thrive with Dylan Gabriel and Jeff Levy because he's so versatile. And I think he, in the starting three, if you're running 11 personnel as your base, him with Theo Wees and Marvin Mims, that provides you a really versatile uh, set of wide receivers that you can move around the offense to find mismatches. And I think Jalil Farouk is going to be the guy that the, one of the guys that thrives in this offense. 2022 class, same question, offensive player, a defensive player who you think might make an impact in 2022 oh, or that man. you're most excited to watch. No, I, Again, it's the really easy answer as far as the defensive side of the ball, but man, Jaron Kanak has the chance to play and play a lot for Oklahoma as a true freshman. Uh, the word I keep hearing regurgitated to describe Jaron Kanak is simply freak. 
Okay. Like he has blown people away throughout winter workouts with his combination of speed and strength and sheer athleticism. And you plug him into that linebacker room. There's already conversation of about moving David Aguebu to edge. And I don't know if that has to do more with David Aguebu and what he brings to the table physically, maybe that translating better to the edge position or whether that honestly has more to do with the fact that <laughs> Jaron Kanak might be too good to keep off the field at inside mm -hmm. linebackers. So I am really excited to see what he becomes. I can see him fitting into that hybrid Sam linebacker nickel type of role that Brent Venables deployed at Clemson with guys like Isaiah Simmons. That's that's the type of mold that I can see Jaron Kanak filling in Oklahoma's defense. Another guy that I think uh, has the opportunity to, contrib to contribute significantly as a true freshman is Robert Spears Jennings uh, as a safety. But on the offensive side, I am hearing a lot of early buzz for Caden Helms and Javante Barnes. And uh, I have been the president of the Javante Barnes hive for close to a year at this point. I thought that guy was the best pure running back in the 2022 cycle. And I, it's no knock on Eric Gray and Marcus Major because those two guys are good. But, man, I think Javante Barnes has the opportunity to draw a couple starts, if I'm being completely uh, straight with you, at the running back position. I think he could be poised for the most impactful season that Oklahoma has had from a freshman running back since Trey Sermon in 2017 or even Samaj P. Ryan in 2014. And I do think Caden Helms is going to steal at least a few snaps from Braden Willis at tight end. Well, I think a guy like Caden Helms – is somebody that you can split out into the slot, find some mismatch opportunities, even split them out wide and see if you can pull a linebacker out there and just see what happens. He's got the size and athleticism to make some plays down the field for you. Even if he's, if he, even if he doesn't factor into just kind of the base package tight end snaps, there's a lot of ways that you can use a guy with his size and athleticism. Parker, man, it's always a great time having you on. Thank you so much for taking the time to jump on with us here on Locked On Sooners. Make sure you go check him out on 94.7, The Ref in Norman. You can also find them on the Ref app in your app store. Also check out his work at OUinsider.com, part of the 247 Sports Network. Parker's going to be all over the place over the next month checking out the recruits in the 2023 and 2024 classes and maybe beyond that. Are there guys that show up that are part of the 25 class? Well, I mean, yeah, just mention one of them in Isaiah Mosey. So oh, yeah. another guy that I'm working on confirming his visit next weekend to Oklahoma is Armando Blunt, uh, who is a world-class shot putter in addition to one of the best defensive linemen in the 2025 class. So, uh, again, that's a guy that I'm hearing buzz he could be on campus next week at Oklahoma. So a lot of exciting stuff happening. Make sure you're checking out Parker's work. Wherever he's, wherever he's at, he's all over the place, but follow him on Twitter at Parker Thune. Parker, always a great time having you on. All right. Take care, John. All right. And that's going to do it for today's episode of Locked On Sooners. Make sure you're subscribed wherever you get your podcasts, free and available on every podcast network. You can also subscribe on YouTube. Make sure you drop a comment in the comment section. If there's a player that you'd like Parker to talk about next time we have him on, just make sure you put a reply in there and we'll make sure to ask him about it. Until next time, I'm John Williams for Parker Thune. Boomer Sooner.